So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Top 10s. I'm your host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about 10 bizarre ocean facts you probably didn't know. And since I love the ocean, I'll be sharing some additional facts throughout the video, specifically about sharks. So in the comments, let us know what your favorite kind of shark is. Mine is the cookie cutter shark, um, also known as the wobbegong, I believe, which both words are just fun to say. And the cookie cutter shark earned its name because it takes small, almost spherical bites out of pretty much everything. And they found cookie cutter shark bites on everything from whales to internet cables. And in fact, the world's internet supply is greatly at risk of predation by cookie cutter sharks and other sharks because they can detect like the, the energy coming off the cables and find it curious. And when sharks are curious, they tend to bite the thing they're curious about. So as a result, when they go down to try and fix ethernet cables and things like that, they'll find like these tiny little like melon baller size holes missing out of the cables. And like, oh, a cookie cutter shark tried to eat the internet. Rad, but let's get on with the video. So it's often stated that we know more about outer space than we do about our own oceans. and. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. There's a lot of the ocean that remains unexplored, and within those unexplored regions, there's probably a bunch of cool stuff we don't know. But still, what we do know about the ocean is pretty insane, and there are a bunch of facts about the ocean and its deepest, darkest depths that would probably blow your mind. Allow us now to share 10 of the ones our writer found. That writer being Jesse Clark. Give them a follow below on their socials. But let's get to the 10th entry, which is number 10, the world's largest mountain range. So if we were to ask you what the world's largest mountain range is, you might say the Himalayas or the Andes, and it's not either of those. Technically, the largest mountain range on the Earth is actually under the ocean, and it's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge, which admittedly isn't very good branding. It spans over 40,000 miles, 64,000 kilometers for those of you who prefer the metric system, across the globe, making it longer than any mountain range on land. Despite its enormous size, though, it's not widely recognized wonder because, well, you can't really see it because it's all the way down there. The mid-ocean ridge is essentially a chain of underwater mountain hills and rift valleys that encircle the earth like the seams on a baseball almost. And it's formed by, if you happen to forget this lesson of geography from high school, the tectonic plates like smashing and coming apart, unleashing magma, which rises to the surface and sometimes peaks out above the surface of the waves, creating new islands like Iceland. And it's kind of weird to think of land masses like that as effectively being the very tippy tops of mountains, but by the technical definition of what a mountain is, that's exactly what they are. It's just that the rest of the mountain is under the water, which is awesome, right? And speaking of awesome, number nine, underwater waterfalls. Underwater waterfalls don't sound like something that can exist, and technically they don't because the underwater waterfalls that you can see aren't technically waterfalls under the definition of what a waterfall is. The word waterfall has now lost all meaning for me. However, they do look very much like waterfalls as we'd understand them, and if anyone curious about how they're created, they're basically an optical illusion caused by a combination of three things. Varying currents, water densities, and dramatic changes in seafloor topography, combining in a very specific way that results in the optical illusion of water falling under the water, like a Spongebob episode. And one of the most famous examples of an underwater waterfall can be found near Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. The illusion occurs at the point where the steep underwater drop-off plunges into the depths, creating a stark contrast in water density. Sand, silt, and other sediments get carried by ocean currents, giving the impression of water cascading down, mimicking the illusion of a waterfall. These underwater waterfalls are not fixed and don't behave like terrestrial waterfalls, i.e. they can move around or just stop existing if the water current changes. And they're influenced by everything from shifting currents and the movement of water masses, creating an ever-changing spectacle, which admittedly sounds way cooler. And unfortunately though, because they move around a lot, you can't find like prizes behind them like you would a regular waterfall in a video game. And while they're not technically waterfalls, the underwater phenomenon that offer a fascinating glimpse into the intricacies of ocean currents and underwater geography. That also happens to look very, very cool. Speaking of very cool, number eight, the immortal jellyfish. The immortal jellyfish, scientifically known as Turritopsis dornii, is exactly what it sounds like. It's the thing found mainly in the Mediterranean, can revert its aging process, and essentially start its life cycle anew, a theoretically infinite number of times. And the way this works is whenever the jellyfish finds itself facing unfavorable conditions, whatever they may be, be it injury or even the natural course of aging, like see here, the jellyfish can transform its adult cells back into their earliest form, known as a polyp. This process, known as transdifferentiation, allows the jellyfish to essentially reset its biological clock and then start the aging process all over again. 
again, theoretically, an infinite number of times. And this ability to reverse the aging process allows the jellyfish to achieve what is essentially immortality as we'd understand it, and it sets it apart from any other animal on Earth that we know of. And to be clear, immortal doesn't mean invincible. The jellyfish can die, it's just that it can't die via the natural aging process. And this is time for an extra bonus fact, not about sharks, but about sponges. And sponges are basically the opposite of this jellyfish in that like, they can live for a very long time, um, certainly, but they are seemingly immune to all forms of physical damage and harm. For example, if you've got a sea sponge in your hands and ripped it apart and then put the two separate parts in different like containers, they would grow into two new sponges. Damn it, I got a message. Stop it. No, mute. I'm talking about a sponge. And for anyone curious, yes, scientists have taken this idea to its logical extreme and put a sponge in a blender and then put the resulting slurry back into a container to see what would happen and the sponge reformed. Likewise, they passed them through sieves or even like, you know, separated them into hundreds and thousands of separate pieces and put each of those pieces into different containers. And each time the sponge grows back, um, usually in the shape of a middle finger to nature. Well, moving on, number seven, the Sargasso Sea. Located in the North Atlantic Ocean, the Sargasso Sea is known for its vast stretches of Sargossian seaweed. What sets this sea apart is the absence of shores and boundaries, making it unique among the world's maritime bodies. It's essentially just a large gear, an area of rotating ocean currents, and it's where several major ocean currents converge. One of the most intriguing features of the Sargasso Sea is the distinctive seaweed itself. This free-floating seaweed forms dense mats on the ocean's surface, providing a habitat for a wide array of marine life, from tiny crustaceans to larger animals like fish and adorable turtles. These mats of Sargossum create a distinctive and vital ecosystem in what might otherwise seem like a desolate part of the ocean. Interestingly, the Sargosso Sea is known for being a spawning ground for the European and American eel. Eels born in the Sargosso Sea journey thousands of miles to rivers and lakes in North America and Europe where they spend most of their lives before returning to the Sargosso Sea to reproduce and start the cycle anew. Seemingly, it's just genetically ingrained in them to return to their spawning grounds. Isn't that cool? I also like eels as well. Does anyone else like that? Eels just go, pew, and when they poke out of rocks, it's very adorable. Did anyone see as well, during the uh, the pandemic, there's a uh, aquarium in Japan, I think the Kyoto Aquarium, which I've actually been to, and they have one of the only whale shark specimens in an aquarium in the world. And they have these little eels that poke out of the um, the sand, and they had to get people to like live stream and call them because the eels, without contact with humans, were getting too nervous, and they were worried that when the aquarium reopened, like, the eels would not come out of the sand because they'd be too stressed. So they were inviting people to just like Zoom call eels, which is amazing. Ah, <sighs> moving on. Number six: glacial underwater lakes. Glacial underwater lakes, also known as brine pools or brine lakes, are found in deep ocean basins around the world. These underwater lakes are a result of processes related to salt concentrations and temperatures, creating a surreal underwater environment that's very eerie, very spooky, and very cool looking. These lakes are formed when dense saline water, which is heavier than the surrounding ocean water due to its high salt content, settles at the bottom of the ocean floor. The specific composition of these brine lakes is a result of several factors, including the dissolution of ancient salt deposits and hydrothermal vent activity. I can't believe I got through that one in one take. And what makes these underwater lakes even more fascinating is their eerie resemblance to terrestrial lakes here on land, complete with shorelines and beaches made of salt deposits. The distinct ecosystems that have evolved around these brine pools are of particular interest to scientists, offering some pretty amazing insights into one of Earth's most remote and extreme environments. And so we're at the halfway point now, so I think it's time for another signature Carl Shark fact. So, the tiger shark, which might be one of the scariest combination of words to like, you know, use to name an apex predator, has another more unassuming, but in my opinion, far more accurate nickname um, in the scientific community, that being the garbage disposal of the sea. Um, they give it this name because tiger sharks are known to eat pretty much everything because they will just bite things when they don't understand what they are. And it's for this reason that tiger sharks are the sharks that most commonly attack humans. And when I say attack here, I mean the shark is curious. And as mentioned in the intro, when sharks are curious, they bite the thing they're curious about, but it's still a shark biting a human, so it gets registered as an attack. And you might be thinking, well, what exactly do you mean by anything, Carl? Because that's a pretty broad statement. So can you give us some examples, which I'm going to do now? So, so an incomplete list of things that have been found in the stomachs of tiger shark specimens includes things like fur coats, a suit of armor, a box of grenades, and a horse's head. You might be wondering, how did a horse's head get into the ocean and then get eaten by a shark? 
Scientists are baffled as well, but it happened, they found it, and they were just as like blown away as everyone is at home right now, I hope. I actually made a video on this for my own channel, Fact Fiend with Carl Smallwood, which if the editor of this one wants to put it in, you can find below. But moving on, number five, the red tide. Scientifically known as harmful algal blooms, or HABs, red tide is a natural phenomenon caused by rapid multiplication of certain species of microscopic algae, often discolouring the water and sometimes producing harmful toxins. These algal blooms typically contain high levels of single-celled algae, such as, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, Carinia brevis, which can produce toxins harmful to marine life and even humans. So the term red tide, as you might expect, comes from the coloration this algae gives the water, usually a red brown. However, it's not always reddish brown and colours like green or even purple have been reported, with the latter being especially awesome sounding, um, ignoring the fact that it's kind of dangerous. So the toxins released by these algae can have some quite severe detrimental effects on the marine ecosystem, including killing fish and being harmful to birds and mammals that feed on said fish. In addition to the ecological impact, red tide can have severe economic consequences, especially in areas dependent on tourism and seafood industries. Human exposure to the toxins produced during a red tide event can result in respiratory irritation, shellfish poisoning and other health issues. And sadly, as climate change worsens, so will red tide. Number four, the bloop. There are plenty of weird things to see and indeed hear in the ocean, but the bloop is on another level. This mysterious and anomalous ultra-low frequency sound was detected in the Pacific Ocean in 1997. It's a deep and powerful noise captured by underwater microphones called hydrophones, which is awesome to learn. And these hydrophones were deployed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or the NOAA. The sound was so loud that it could be heard over 5,000 kilometers away and has puzzled researchers for decades. Initially, some speculation attributed the bloop to enormous sea creatures or undiscovered marine life. However, further investigation revealed that it was likely of geological origin. Scientists eventually identified the sound as consistent with ice quakes, caused by the cracking and movement of large icebergs as they fracture and break apart, which is terrifying to think about, like a, an almost continent-sized piece of ice shattering in half is a, a terrifying thought. The Bloop's discovery highlighted the vast and still largely unexplored nature of the ocean and its ability to produce sounds that can be heard across entire ocean basins. While it turned out to have a natural explanation related to ice movement, the Bloop sparked imagination and fueled interest like few other phenomena have. Number three, whale falls. Whale falls can be found on the ocean floor where the carcass of a whale becomes an ecosystem unto itself. When a whale dies and its massive body sinks, it creates what scientists refer to as a whale fall. These events are significant because they provide sudden and concentrated source of nutrition to the deep sea ecosystem, initiating a complex ecological process. And there's, it starts like on the top and there's videos out there, I'm not sure if you can put clips in, but of, oh yeah, here's just a dead whale floating on the surface, and people just stand on them as like 50 sharks attack the whale. And it's like, okay, I, I get that the whale was big and it would float, but how is it doing so with a guy with balls that big on it? Anyway, as the whale's carcass begins to decompose, it supports a diverse community of organisms. Scavengers like hagfish and sharks, usually the first to arrive, consuming the soft tissues. Over time, the whale's bones become enriched with lipids and proteins, attracting other organisms such as the terrifyingly named bone-eating worms, mollusks and specialised bacteria that aid in decomposition. These creatures form a unique ecosystem around the whale fall, sometimes lasting for decades. Whale falls contribute to the understanding of deep sea biodiversity, nutrient cycling, and the role of large marine organisms in shaping underwater habitats. And sadly, with whales frequently finding themselves on endangered species lists, whale fall phenomenon are going to become less common, and the adverse effects this will have on the deep sea life that they support is yet to be understood. Number two, blue holes. Blue holes are underwater sinkholes or caves, typically found in shallow coastal waters of limestone-rich regions like the Bahamas, Belize, and the Great Barrier Reef. What sets them apart is their mesmerizing deep blue color, often in stark contrast to the lighter waters that typically surround them. These holes can vary in size from a few meters to hundreds of meters in diameter, and can extend to immense depths, which, yeah, I, I'm scared of. Like, well, folks at home, anyone out there, do you have, I believe it's known as, oh, what's it called now? That fear of like open water. Oh, it's going to annoy me now. Let's have a look. Thalassophobia. Yeah, I have that. And stuff like this gives me the heebie jeebies. Like, I am to the point where I can't watch movies with sharks in them because the moment that 
it goes underwater, I instinctually try and hold my breath and I get really stressed um, if the scene is underwater longer than I can hold my breath because I like I start to get anxiety, which I guess makes the movie scarier. Anyone else have that? Moving on. The unique hue of blue holes is explained by the stark difference in water depth and the way light is scattered and absorbed. When sunlight penetrates the surface and goes deeper, it gets absorbed by water molecules, giving it a blue colour. The effect is intensified in blue holes due to their extreme depth. Makes sense. Aside from their appearance, blue holes also hook scientists and divers because of the potential secrets they can hold. They can preserve valuable information about the Earth's past, including ancient climate changes and long extinct species. But be careful, they're not always safe to explore, requiring specialised training and equipment due to the depths involved. And you could not pay me enough money to go into one of those things. So I've got a friend who is training to be a deep sea diver. And he was explaining to me how he got like to the level that he's at. And part of his training involved going underwater to a depth of about 30 meters and then having his instructor take his goggles off him and then turn off his air supply so he can learn how to take off his air supply and put a fresh one on. And he, did, he said that to me and I would have sat there with a beer like this. Speaking of having that exact look on your face, number one, the tongue-eating parasite. So now for a scary one, and probably one a lot of people at home are familiar with, because it tends to make the rounds online quite often, but you might not be familiar with the, all the details of what this thing does. So, the tongue-eating parasite, scientifically known as, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, Siamotha xy, is exactly what it sounds like. This parasitic isopod is known to seek out and parasitize fish, particularly the spotted-nosed snapper and the California sheephead. And the life cycle of this creature begins when it enters the fish through the gills. Once inside, it latches onto the fish's tongue and feeds on the blood vessels called causing the tongue to atrophy and eventually fall off. Once the tongue atrophies to the point it falls off, the isopod performs what we would all recognise as a big brain move, and attaches itself to the tongue stub and then replaces the fish's tongue. Yep, yeah, you, you heard that correctly. This is a bug that eats the tongue of a fish and then replaces the fish's tongue. And you might think the fish will be bothered by this, or like we all are here, horrified, but Weirdly, no, fish don't seem to mind this happening, and fishermen frequently dredge up examples of fish that have the parasite, and they seem to be fine, because they're still eating, and the isopod will replace all the functions that a tongue normally um, uh, does. It just, it takes its share, so it's like, you know, when the fish eats something, it's like yum yum right in fish's tongue, the isopod like, well, why don't you let me wet my beak a little? And it does, and they seem to be okay, as horrifying as that is. Yeah, that's just not nice to think about. It's an ugly planet, a sun planet, a planet hostile to life. So I hope everybody at home found this video as educating, entertaining, as horrifying as I did. Um, if you like the video, leave a like. If you've got any comments, like maybe let us know your favourite marine fish shark fact. And I'll share one last one now with you. And that is the fact that great white sharks are one of the few creatures on Earth we seemingly cannot keep in captivity. With every example of a great white shark in captivity ending with the great white shark either dying for reasons experts can't quite explain, or becoming so distressed that the people who've captured it feel so bad they release it into the ocean. And in one particularly harrowing example, once the shark was captured, it spent pretty much all of its time in captivity, headbutting the glass whenever um, uh, researchers went up to see what it was doing. Um, they eventually released that one into the ocean. Again, I've uh, made a video on this for my channel Fact Fiend, which you can check out at the links below, alongside my socials, links to our sister channels Biographics and Geographics, which I'm also the interim host for, as well as a bunch of other stuff we'd like you to see if you've got the time. Otherwise, thank you for watching today's video, and as always, have the day you all deserve.